hey, Kevin, sorry about that little technical difficulty here. So you, you're you're working no uh, you're working with Wall Street bankers that uh, came in after the market meltdown, and were they were they analysts? Did you say? Yep, they were first and second year analysts at the big banks. Um, most of them in the investment banking division, but some in sales and trading, risk management, things like that. And, and what kind of education did these guys have? In general, so they came from some of the top the top schools, the places that Wall Street takes a lot of kids, um, the Ivies and, and other schools like that. Michigan, um, but not all of them were sort of blue bloods. They were. Um, uh, can you still hear me? Okay. Yep, we're doing good. Oh, okay. So yeah, they they were uh, they were come, came from sort of traditional Wall Street backgrounds, most of them, um, and they I think expected to find Wall Street to be a little bit like you know the one that you see described in Liar's Poker or you know you see in The Wolf of Wall Street. They expected sort of this high flying, um, testosterone charged environment, and I think what they found was it was a much different, more sober, um, kind of less. Uh, less highfalutin place than they'd expected. And uh, of the eight guys that you interviewed in the book, are they still on the street at the firms that they were working at? About when... half of them are. Okay. About, about uh, half of them are. Um, about four have jumped ship actually to, to, to tech startups, which is, I think, uh, a, a very good indicator of where uh, the economy for young college graduates is going. Um, Google, Facebook, et cetera, have really replaced Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, et cetera, as the places where young people want to go. Um, and this happened sort of while I was reporting this book. There was this in, immense sea change um, on Wall Street where the banks were losing their prestige among young people. And just as that was happening, um, you know, Silicon Valley came and started picking off their recruits. Okay, uh, from you know, from working with these guys that were the analysts, uh, you know, they they come and they have to do a lot of lot of research in the companies, and uh, actually, they you know, sometimes you know, we make fun of things that go on as far as like hidden agendas and things like that. Did you did you feel that like some of these recommendations? Did you get the feeling from you know some of these guys that you were interviewing that? You know that there there was uh, some hidden agendas uh, between some of these you know initiations of coverage, perhaps trying to get you know some business from a company, or do you think that they play everything pretty close to the belt? I, I couldn't hear exactly what you said. You're breaking up a little bit. Sorry about that. Is it a question about sort of their their work and their the quality of their research? Yeah, I mean, just like the influences at the firms, you know, for for some of the research and for some of the recommendations. Yeah, I think, I mean, they weren't working in, uh, I didn't follow anyone working in strict sort of equity research, um, but I did follow a number of people whose job it was to sort of prepare deliverables for clients about um, potential mergers, um, acquisition targets, et cetera. And what, what surprised me is that, like, most of the grunt work on Wall Street is done by these sort of exhausted 22-year-olds. Mm -hmm. um, and these, this is not just, like, sort of getting coffee. This is like putting together the decks that run these billion dollar deals. Um, and you know, the, these people who are carrying this out are in some cases right out of college, um, are working 100 hours a week or more, and are totally, totally exhausted beyond the point of, of being productive uh, when it comes to making these pitch books and things like that. So it was a very interesting process watching the way that they coped with both the requirements of their work and just the sheer number of hours that they were in the building. Right. Uh, that that that's interesting. And then you said that you know some of them have left Wall Street for uh, for Silicon Valley. Is that a, a trend you expect to continue? I think so. As long as the tech industry keeps uh, chugging along. I mean, obviously in. 1999, uh, lots of bankers quit and went to Silicon Valley to work there and then came back when the bubble popped. Um, so we'll see. But I think you know, what Silicon Valley has figured out that Wall Street hasn't quite gotten yet is that young people, I think, want more than just money. It's like that was what was surprising to me about these eight people is very few of them had gotten onto Wall Street 
just for the money. They'd come because they thought, you know, this was something that they could do for a couple of years and then go do what their true passion was. Um, and I think Silicon Valley proposed something much more interesting for them, which was come here, we'll pay you well, maybe not as well as the banks, but we'll pay you, you know, uh, you know low six figures for your you know, first couple of years, and we'll give you something that feels virtuous to do. We'll, we'll make you part of something that's good for the world. Um, and I think a lot of people uh, who are stuck in banking, you know, feeling sorry for themselves, that, was, that sounded like a pretty attractive proposition. Okay. All right. We're on the line here with Kevin Roos. He's a writer in New York Magazine and uh, covers business and technology for the magazine at the Daily Intelligencer blog. Uh, you said you you know you keep a close eye you know on the markets. Tech stocks have been you know red hot. Uh, do you do you form any kind of you know opinion on the on the directions of any of these stocks? I do. I like um, I like a lot of the tech stocks. I mean, the, the the thing that's interesting to me is that you know people are have been talking about um, a bubble in the public markets for tech stocks, and really, I think the bubble right now is happening more in the private markets. Um, in 1999, what you saw was that companies were going public as soon as they had their first customers. Yeah, they, they would been, they were they would they were pre revenue, but they were also sort of pre customer in a way. Uh, especially there at the end with Pets.com and things like that. But now, I mean, the, the companies that are going public, they're already um, they're already well established. So look at Box or look at Uber, um, which isn't going public yet, but has raised, um, you know, just raised 1.2 billion dollars, is valued at 18 billion. Um, I mean, these are enormous companies that, by uh, any historical standards, should have gone public long ago. But the, I think between sort of the, the sort of narrowed pipeline for IPOs because of, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley and things like that, and just the sort of general, um, you know, the, the, the attitude among tech founders that, you know, I don't want to go public if I don't have to. Um, I think there's a lot more action sort of happening in the private markets than there is, um, you know, in the publicly traded tech stocks right now. That said, um, I think the what we're seeing is that the market is actually, like, acting pretty rationally with respect to tech stocks. I, I, I think if you look at the ones that are succeeding and failing, um, probably Amazon.com uh, accepted. Most of them are fairly profitable. They have uh, at least top-line growth, um, and they're seeing um, some you know, good trends in customer acquisition and things like that. So I, I think you know, I, I, I don't like to talk about bubble or non-bubble. I think it's sort of an outdated okay. metric, but I, I do think that um, people are acting a little more uh, with a little more sanity than they did in 1999. Okay, all right, that uh, that's a good take on the market. Uh, Kevin Roos, writer at New York New York Magazine. Kevin, uh, thanks uh, for coming on. We'll have to keep an eye out for that book, Young Money. Sounds like uh, something uh, that may want to read. So thanks a lot for coming on. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me.